हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम अमरनाथ सो इन दिस सेशन वी विल डिस्कस द क्वेश्चन आज इन पब्लिक एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ऑप्शनल ऑफ यूपीएससी मेन्स ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू सो दीज आर द क्वेश्चन टेकन फ्रॉम पेपर वन सो फर्स्ट इन दिस सेशन विल ट्राई टू डिस्कस द क्वेश्चन ऑफ पेपर वन सेक्शन ये राइट सो कमिंग टू द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन राइट विच इज आज फॉर टेन मार्क्स राइट सो पब्लिक मैनेजमेंट टेक्स वॉट एंड वाई फ्रॉम पब्लिक एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन एंड हाउ फ्रॉम बिजनेस मैनेजमेंट राइट सो हियर द क्वेश्चन रिवॉल्व अराउंड पब्लिक मैनेजमेंट so whatever we write our answer should be on this public management all right so the geography of the question should be public management with two important focal points one is what and why from public administration and second one is how from business management so our focus of the answer should be on these two elements right so as the question is about public management so definitely it is about right a part of state administration or public administration so the question itself gives the answer that is public management takes what and why from public administration and how from public management so we need to highlight so what is taken from public administration and what is taken from a uh, business management so first of all our answer should focus on why it is called as public management all right so what is the reason for using this word of public management so here to answer this question we can take the hint from changing nature of state changing nature of state particularly the present corporate state the state that is influenced because of neo liberal philosophy a state that is guided by the principle of new public management all right so by using that hint we can define what is public management then what this public management takes from public administration as well as from business management so from public man uh, from public administration what and why is taken so we need to highlight what and why from public administration that is with what public administration is concerned about all right why public administration is concerned about so what are the focal areas of public administration which are taken into public management right so that means the ethicalness the moralness right the publicness of public administration the service orientation of public administration right and public administration is always seen as a moral act and public administrators are always regarded as a moral agent so this is taken from public administration right so on one hand public management takes about public management has took ethicalness moralness and publicness from public administration and from business management so the techniques of administrating that is how to administer how to implement that is from uh, from business management the technical aspect the technical aspect is taken that is the technique of implementation all right so the principles of the principles of business management the principles of administration all right the principles that are to be followed in implementing the public policies or in providing the services 
right so with highest uh, importance given to three e's efficiency economy and effectiveness so this is from business management and this is from public administration so public management essentially public management essentially right talks about publicness of public administration it talks about techniques of public administration so this should be our part of the answer and if it is possible you can also use the statement of louis mariam who regarded public administration like two blades of a scissor so one blade is about the subject matter of public administration the second blade is about the technique of public administration all right so this should be our answer all right so that is we can uh, ultimately conclude that so public management public management has brought both the elements of publicness of public administration and the technique of business management to one single area that is what the answer should be all right so this is about the first question coming to second question second question is about the state it is about rensis likert all right so here the question revolves around four system management so if we can identify this the answer is over four system management of rensis likert so which is seen as four different styles of leadership four different styles of management or we can also see it as four different ways of administering organizations or right public administration so we can uh, use this even into public administration so the uh, focal uh, the uh, the locus of this question the locus of this question is about four system management given by rensis likert and the question reads that every human organization shall start from system 1 and ultimately end up with system 4 comment on rensis likert statement all right so every human organization every human organization it starts from system 1 so first of all in the first paragraph of the answer we should identify what are the four systems as given by rensis likert that is what is system 1 system 2 system 3 system 4 right so <clears throat> exploitative authority to benevolent authority to participate to consultative right so these are four different styles so the question says that every human organization it starts from system 1 that is it starts as an authoritative system but all, and ends up with a consultative system that is what the question so uh, yes we can agree with the what do you call uh, princes like it so let me focus on the answer the flow of answer in first paragraph we should talk about what are four different systems all right and coming to the question all right so shall start from so this should be the starting point of our core answer so every organization in its uh, in its uh, existence for, for its existence it should be authoritative right so an organization for its existence it need to show that authoritativeness right and along with authoritativeness slowly it should promote participative as well as a consultative style of management right only those organization will survive if they allow participation of workers or employees if they allow consultation along with the workers so here participation and consultation means it is management along with the workers right so an organization in their initial days they start as an authoritative one for its survival for its existence but this alone will not ensure the existence of an organization right so unless it adopts a participative approach and a consultative approach right in the uh, in the working of organization in the functioning of management so every organization will exist if they are right uh, if they follow this four different styles as given by rensis likert but here rensis likert has given his approach right or is theory based upon the characters of management and the characters of the employees but he uh, he has uh, what you call uh, uh, failed to understand the impact of situations in which the organization is 
existing so even situational factors the environmental factors always plays an important role for the survival of an organization for the existence of an organization so all right so along with uh, the management style along with the management and the workers what is important is all right the situation so you can bring in all right the contingency model as given by fe fiedler so who has highlighted the importance of situation not only this fiedler even before fiedler we have a uh, mary parker follett who talked about the importance of situation so that means all right so uh, the survival of an organization depends equally on situations in which the organizations are working all right so that means every human organization shall start from system 1 and system 4 uh, and, and end up with system 4 it is possible it is possible only when situational factors are ignored but if situational factors are taken into consideration it is always may not be true all right so coming to a concluding part coming to a concluding part so here this existence of an organizations right right existence of an organization may uh, may not necessarily start from system 1 or end up with system 4 it can be any kind of combination it can be any kind of combination of all these four different styles so it is a situation that will determine so they may start from system 1 or they may start from system 4 it depends upon the situation the con uh, the contingent factors the environmental factors in which the organization is existing right so it may not necessarily start from system 1 and end up with system 4 so that is the that should be the answer that should be the conclusion so we will start our answer with the uh, in support of uh, this like it but at the same time we should also bring the importance of these situational factors right in the existence of an organization right so this is what we should uh, highlight in this question right next coming to the uh, next question so this is a question which is taken from the chapter of administrative law so in paper one we have a topic of administrative law there we have a sub topic of administrative tribunals the question is based upon this tribunals all tribunals are codes and uh, but all codes are not tribunals right so here we should identify the essential characters of a tribunal right the first part of the answer it uh, would start from essential characters of tribunals second part why tribunals should be called as courts because of the uh, functional similarity between tribunals and courts we can call them as tribunals are courts right because tribunals are nothing but a quasi judicial bodies but there is a difference there is a difference between right tribunals and courts so we should uh, bring out this essential features of tribunals right so why tribunals are regarded as courts so we need to bring out functional similarity now but all courts are not tribunals now here the point of difference lies so why tribunals cannot be regarded as courts why tribunals uh, tribunals are not courts so what is the essential difference the uh, essential difference between the tribunals and courts tribunals are quasi judicial bodies and courts are purely judicial bodies all right so now this so this uh, these are uh, this is the crux of the answer why tribunals are not courts why all the courts are not tribunals all tribunals as they are involved in judicial function all they are as they are involved in adjudication function they are called as courts whereas all courts are not tribunals right so only quasi judicial bodies only quasi courts they are tribunals all right so now in the concluding point we should bring all right the supportive role of tribunals to the courts so how tribunals are important how tribunals support the judicial systems or the judicial bodies 
right so that is if possible if possible in one or two lines we should also bring out the reasons for the growth of tribunals that is the impact of administrative law on tribunals all right so if possible before concluding all right we should bring out this importance of administrative law on growth of tribunals all right so this should be the flow of the answer right so let us now move to the next question classical organization theory formed bedrock for the modern organization theories analyze all right so this question if you take if, if you see this question just now we have seen a question on rensis likert all right so every organization every organization should start shall start from system 1 and and, and uh, it should end up with system 4 so there is a match between the question asked on right i like it and this question so every model is classical organization theory all right form the bedrock for the modern organization theories all right so classical organization theory so what does this classical organization theory so first of all we need to highlight what is classical organization theory that is mechanistic theory of organizations so we can call it as a mechanistic theory of organization the focal elements of mechanistic theory of organization so administrative management theory right scientific management theory the best example of this right so you can we can use we can use a well accepted uh, 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 futures of right the basic assumptions of futures of scientific management theory as given by taylor and administrative management theory as given by henry fayol right so we can start our answer we can start our answer from this point that is every organizational theory right it is purely based upon the basic concepts of classical organization theory so the modern theories of organization they got emerged right either in support of this classical organization theory or in criticism of this classical organization theory so that means so first of all we should uh, what uh, we should answer what is classical organization theory the basic features of this right and how this classical organization theory went on it was how it was changed so what is the kind of change brought in the subsequent changes brought in classical organization theories right so you can use the example of changes brought by what you call mayo and his uh, human relations theory then you can also bring out the uh, changes brought by ca bernard ca bernard on this uh, classical organization theory bernard's concept of organization chris ajari's concept of uh, organization all right systems approach of organization all right so that means the contemporary theories of organization <coughs> <laughs> right you can bring in systems theory right <laughs> i'm sorry system theory then uh, we can use uh, argyris so here it is not necessary to answer all these things you can use roughly one or two because uh, as it is asked for only 10 marks so we need to show this kind of uh, change in the organizational theory so you can use these and say that the present day organizational theories are built upon the uh, classical organization theories 
and if possible if possible all right you can also bring out the present day the uh, the uh, present or types of organization say matrix organizations boundless organizations all right so these are the the newer forms of uh, organizations so we can explain even these organizations right as a continuation of classical organization theories all right so that is how we should analyze this question so use uh, two or three examples and uh, analyze the question but our uh, our conclusion for this answer should be that every organizational theory should start from classical organization theories that is it is it is well right to say that classical organization theories are bedrock for the modern organizational theories that should be our conclusion all right so this is about the question moving to the next question so this question is about from the topic of development administration all right it is a question are uh, picked from development administration so if, if you take this question interaction between the state and civil society has hitherto largely neglected especially in developing countries examine interaction between state and civil society so these are the two things that we should uh, that we should uh, pick up for our answer so interaction between state and civil society has hitherto been largely neglected in the developing countries all right so now traditional development theory traditional development concept or traditional development theories that is state led development theories bureaucracy led development theories all right so first of all the state and civil society so we need to identify what is state and what is civil society all right so if possible in 20 lines try to define what is state and civil society all right and in the context of developing countries in the context of developing countries because when you go to developed countries again the interaction between state and civil society changes all right so as it is a, a question about developing countries so we need to highlight the interaction between state and civil society only from the context of developing countries and it is evident that in developing countries all right the interaction is neglected so here reasons for neglect what is the reason for this neglect all right so state led bureaucracy led development state led and bureaucracy led development all right where people are just seen as end receivers all right people are just seen society or people are just seen as the end beneficiary without any active participation that is people and society are just seen as a passive elements right in the developing countries right that is the reason why that is the reason why there is slow progress or there is a failed development in developing countries right so instead of using the word failed we can uh, diplomatically say that there is a slow progress slow progress in terms of development all right so now what is the reason for what is the reason for this what you call state led and bureaucratic development so why people are seen as a passive one why not active agents so we need to highlight this reasons so our answer should focus on this reasons for neglecting civil society reasons for neglecting the importance of civil society along with the state right so 80% of uh, answer should revolve around this reasons so that is we should highlight these reasons give three or four uh, points give the reasons in three or four points it is more than enough for this answer all right so as the question is about examining so we need to examine the reasons for neglect of the interaction between state and society all right so in the conclusion 
it should be a pragmatic conclusion that is right we should conclude that civil society is as equal as state in bringing the development so you can use the principles of good governance what good governance is people participation bureaucratic accountability political accountability decentralized development right so for all these things we require participation of civil society so civil society has an important role right to play in development particularly in developing countries because it is this civil society which will fulfill the objectives of good governance developing uh, fulfill the objectives of development right so these are we can uh, give the answer so moving to the uh, next question moving to question number 2 that is a question is about constitutionality of administrative state right so uh, let me read the question once the administrative state is the creation of a power to bind us with the rules that are not made by legislature discuss the constitutionality of administrative state and its future right so the administrative state is the creation of a power to bind us with the rules read the question surrounds around it revolves around the administrative state so bureaucratic state right a state that is governed a state that is dominated by administrative rules I'm sorry. <coughs> a state that is dominated by administrative law. Simply, administrative state or a bureaucratic state is nothing but a state that is governed, that is dominated by administrative law. That means those laws which are made by administration but not by the legislature. The question itself gives the answer. Right? So, now, do this administrative state or bureaucratic state which is based upon administrative law has any constitutionality so that is what the question so first of all we need to define what is administrative state reasons for growth of administrative state that is simply reasons for the growth of administrative law and its impact on administrative state all right so what is the reason for this so if we can use here all right uh, different factors all right the traditional factors and the contemporary factors then coming to the point of the constitutionality constitutionality of administrative state all right so now here we should bring out the importance of control over administrative law all right so how the administrative law and administrative state is controlled by the constitutional law or the constitutional state now that means what i mean a state that is guided by constitution a state that is gu guided by the law of people law of parliament so now constitutionality of administrative state lies in control over control over administrative state by constitution as well as by legislature so how constitutional uh, ensures control over this administrative law and how parliament or, or how legislature will control the administrative law so simply the question is about control over administrative law and administrative state all right so all right so the constitutionality of this administrative state lies in control over this administrative state so not only we have control by constitution or control by legislature but even the citizen control 
so the contemporary controls are citizens control right so this is how we should give the answer right so what is its future the future lies the future lies right in having control over such administrative state right so once again define what is administrative state reasons for the growth of administrative state and here you can use as i said right uh, uh, the uh, factors as given by gerald gaiden right so right so it is it is karl gaiden who talked about this what do you call reasons for the growth of administrative state right so uh, growth of public administration you can also use the same kind of factors even for the growth of administrative state the contemporary uh, what do you call factor that is those factors after the emergence of lpg right and then talk about constitutionality of administrative state then its future lies in control over administrative state in the form of constitutional control legislative control and citizen control right so this should be the crux of the answer so every answer or any answer should revolve around these points right so let us now move to the next question the question is on leadership role again so the question is on transformational leadership transformational leadership requires high degree of coordination communication and cooperation explain all right so transformational leadership requires high degree of coordination communication and cooperation all right so first of all what is this transformational leadership what is transformational leadership so it is a part of contemporary theories of leadership right so how this transformational leadership how this transformational leadership is different from transactional transactional theory of leadership not only from transactional theory of leadership how it is different from traditional theories of leadership all right then bring out the different functions perform uh, different functions performed by leadership or functions of transactional sorry functions of transformational leaders all right and the qualities qualities that are required for transformational leaders all right so here the question itself gives the answer high degree of coordination communication so what is coordination what kind of coordination is required so what kind of communication it would be much better if you can use right uh, the views of bernard here right so bernard and where it is there bernard who talked about leaderships and qualities of leadership right so coordination communication and <laughs> cooperation how to ensure cooperation right what need to be coordinated what kind of communication is required and how to promote cooperation <laughs> sorry so highlight the qualities of leadership uh, trans uh, transformational leader right then conclude the answer that transformational leader is the need of the hour in the present day organizations not only organizations but even for public sector units or public administrators right the present day administrators the present day civil servants they require they need the qualities of a transformational leaders right so with this point conclude the answer going to the next question human relation is postulates 
that what is important to a worker and what influences his or her productivity level may not be the organizational chart but his or her associations with the other workers is it more relevant today it is simply about the basic assumptions theory of human relations theory the basic assumptions and the theory of human relations theory as given by elton mayo and its present day relevance right so human relations postulated what is important to a worker and what influences the worker's productivity level right may not be the organizational chart but his or her association with the other workers all right so what is its impact or what is its relevant so according to what is human relations theory first of all what is this theory is what are the basic assumptions so we have uh, we can use what is regarded as cornerstone of human relations theory all right so what is what is regarded as cornerstone of what do you call uh, this social sciences right the uh, relation between moral the relationship between productivity and supervision so here coming to this uh, second question the second question is about that is second c it is a question on human relations theory or the impact and the relevance of human relations theory all right human relations postulate that what is important to a worker and what influences his or her productivity level may not be the organizational chart but his or her associations with the other workers is it more relevant today all right so question when you see, when you see the lines of question these lines of the questions uh, they seem to be uh, what you call more complex but when we break this it is very easy to answer all right so so what is human relations theory what is human relations theory what are the basic postulates of what are the basic postulates of human relations theory all right and how this human relations theory promotes productivity all right uh, right now here you can use also the link between supervision moral and productivity you can also bring out the uh, elton mayo sartron experiment and its importance in increasing productivity of an organization all right so and what do you call uh, conclude the answer that is here our answer should focus on the basic postulates of human relations theory a postulates which cannot be defined by an organization all right those postulates right which are not defined in the organizational chart which are not mentioned in the organizational chart say for example the kind of human relations the the kind of relations between the workers role of informal organizations all right role of human oriented supervision so which are not which are not defined in the organization and it is not possible to define these postulates in the organization though they are not defined in the organization 
but plays an important role in promoting the productivity. This is what proved by Elton Mayo through his half road experiments. All right. So we need to highlight the essence of this half road experiment and its impact on productivity. All right. So that should be the crux of the answer. Our answer, the crux of the answer lies in this second point. All right. So it would be much better and impressive if we can use this relation between supervision, moral and productivity, which is regarded as a cornerstone of social sciences. All right. Uh, the logic of efficiency will not go along with the logic of sentiment. The logic of sentiment versus logic of efficiency, which, ha which was proved by Hawthorne experiment, right, by Elton Mayo, which is, which is again treated as a cornerstone of human relations movement. So if you can highlight these kind of points in the answer, definitely you will get a very good marks. Right. So now coming to the relevance. Right. So this, uh, these basic postulates of human relations theory, they always have a lasting importance. They are long lasting. Always they are important. That means not an organizational productivity and success of an organization does not depend solely upon the organizational chart or the formalistic aspects, but also depends equally on informal aspects, informal organizations, that is those aspects which are not defined in the organization chart, right? So we should give importance, equal importance to both uh, formally defined aspects as well as those aspects which cannot be defined formally through organization. So our conclusion should highlight both these elements, both formal as well as informal elements of an organization, right? So that means, is it relevant today? Yes, it has every relevance. So this is about the question. Coming to next question. <coughs> Bernard posits the zone of indifference as a human condition that animates authority relationships and cooperations in modern organizations. Examine Bernard's, Bernard posits the zone of indifference as the human condition that animates authority relationships and cooperation in modern organizations. All right. So the question is about Bernard's theory and Bernard's theory specifically on zone of indifference. All right. So which is seen as essential human condition, which is seen as essential human condition. All right in the modern organizations. So the question is very simple to answer. All right. So what is Bernard's theory? All right. First of all, define what are organizations according to Bernard, Bernard's concept of organization, right? What is zone of indifference? So how zone of indifference is highlighted by Bernard as an essential character of communication. All right. So zone of, uh, uh, what is zone of indifference? What is the importance of zone of indifference in the words of Bernard? So why this zone of indifference is required? So acceptance of communication, acceptance of communication, rejection of communication depends upon zone of indifference as given by Bernard. So Bernard's concept of zone of indifference and its relationship with the acceptance of communication. Acceptance of communication. So zone of indifference as the essential human condition, right? That will determine the authority relationship. That is, it is the zone of indifference, right? That will determine superior subordinate relationships, subordinate accepting the communication, right superior uh, exercising his authority right so superiors exercise of authority subordinates acceptance of authority lies in acceptance of communication only which again in turn depends upon this zone of uh, indifference so zone of indifference which will determine authority relationship that is superior subordinate relationships right so giving of communication, receiving of communication, exercising of authority, acceptance of authority. 
Alright? So, cooperation. That is cooperation between the superior and subordinate in getting the, uh, in, uh, in uh, fulfilling the objectives of organization. So, the objectives of organization, objectives which is one of the fundamental pillars of an organization can be achieved only when there is a cooperation. Cooperation between all the men. So, when we define Bernard's theory of organization, we will also highlight this, uh, what you call, definition of organization as a system of cooperating individuals. Alright? So, as a system of individuals uh, cooperating within the organization. Alright? So, so that is, uh, by this zone of indifference is a human condition, right, in determining the authority relationships as well as cooperation. So, we need to highlight both this element. Alright, so that means we should bring out the importance of zone of indifference. So, when there will be zone of indifference, what are the challenges of zone of indifference, right? So, what is zone of indifference? What is the importance of zone of uh, indifference? How this zone of indifference will promote authority relationships? How this zone of indifference will promote cooperation? What are challenges in building this zone of indifference? That is, what are the hurdles faced in creating zo uh, this zone of indifference? So, Bernard talks about zone of indifference, zone of difference also. Right? So, we should also highlight these hurdles in bringing out zone of indifference. Right? So, what happens if there is no indifference? What happens if there is no zone of indifference? Because this question is asked for 20 marks. We need to bring out the holistic picture of zone of indifference. So, our answer should revolve around this topic of zone of indifference. So, why, what is it? Why it is required? What are the advantages? What are the hurdles faced in it? Alright? So, what is the role of a leader or executive in creating this zone of indifference? How it can be created? So, all these points need to be highlighted. Right? So, this is the uh, question is. Coming to the next question. The next question is on new public service. New public, uh, new public service celebrates what is distinctive, important and meaningful about public services discuss right so what is this new public service right so first what is nps who gave this concept of nps the conditions for emergence of nps all right how nps has distinctive futures all right i'm sorry uh, futures of NPS, that is co-governance, community governance, right? change role of bureaucracy, people participation. Right? So, we need to highlight, we need to highlight this basic futures of NPS, right? NPS and its futures. So, for last three years, continuously questions are asked on new public service. Right? And how NPS is an improvement? Right? In what way it is distinctive? In what way it is important? It is dis in what way it is distinctive from NPM? What is importance? Importance lies in its futures. Right? Meaningfulness of NPS lies in bringing new orientation. Listening, not telling. Right? Servicing, not steering. Right? So, these are the new things which are important in NPS. So, the meaningfulness of what we call NPS, that is, meaningfulness lies in bringing new orientation to public services. Right? So, in what way it is distinctive, why it is important, in what way it is, what is the meaningfulness of public services. Right, so we need to highlight these three points. Right, so compared with NPM, bring out the futures here and bring out the new orientation brought by NPS. That's it, the answer is over. Right, so next coming to the next question.
strategic communication or to be an agile communication process discuss the conceptualization of strategic communication for the government actions strategic communication or to be agile the question revolves around the topic of communication so we have a topic uh, though not mentioned uh, in main syllabus earlier it was a part of the prelim syllabus basic principles of public administration so communication is one of the basic principle of public administration so though it is not mentioned still we can uh, use or we can uh, 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 take the uh, insights from uh, insights from bernard's concept of communication importance of communication as given by bernard right and other thinkers right so first of all what is strategic communication all right the basic meaning here there is a word called as strategic so we need to highlight this word of strategic so what is strategic communication so why communication is important so first of all what is communication so first of all our uh, first of our answer should start from what is communication what is strategic communication all right so why it is called as strategic communication all right how to build how to build or the principles need to be followed all right the principles need to be followed in building strategic communication the basic challenges right in building this communication channels as well as particularly strategic communication channels because it is very important for government actions right so uh, today's government the complex government right which has larger array of functions multiple functions complex functions right so as government is involved in multitudinous functions as it necessary to ensure what you call coordination cooperation among all the uh, state agencies so there is a need to build a formal and important formal precise well defined channels of communication particularly in certain areas which are seen or which are regarded as strategic in nature all right so we need to highlight the basic challenges in building such strategic uh, uh, communication that is basic challenges then how to overcome these challenges so when we talk about strategic communication need not be necessarily with certain elements of government functions like defense or the security it can be even welfare functions of the state require strategic communication channels right so how to build this communication channels what is what are the normal challenges faced how to overcome this right so and end the answer by having a very good a uh, conclusion so communication is always seen as the uh, life blood of government life blood of organizations no organization or no government can exist without the channels of communication right so no government can achieve its objectives without properly defining its communication channels particularly the strategic communication channels right so that is should be the answer coming to a uh, fourth question so for a uh, fourth question is on leadership so leadership is seen as dealing with change whereas administration is viewed as coping with the complexity all right in this context discuss the contextuality of leadership and administration for the success of an organization all right so question is about two things all right leadership and administration remember previously for uh, two times question was asked on difference between leader and uh, administrator all right so earlier questions were asked on leader uh, leader and administrator even i wrote the answer on this uh, question of leader and administrator for the first time this was asked in 2008 mains right leadership is seen as now the question is about leadership and administration 
leadership and administration now leaders can become administrators administrators can become leaders based upon the context so it is that context it is a context in which the, the uh, administrators are functioning it is a context in which the leaders are discharging their functions it is this context which will define their roles right so now if you look at the question right if you look at the question question self gives leadership is seen as dealing with change so important function of a leader is to bring change right so whereas administration is viewed with the coping of complexities so the question pinpoints the question limits the role of a leader and the administration so leadership according to what you call uh, question is about bringing change whereas administration is about coping with the complexity all right so we need to discuss the contextuality of the leadership and administration all right so here under what context under what context the leader becomes an administrator all right under what context the leader is involved in bringing change all right in what context the administration is uh, administration is concerned with the dealing of complexities all right so this is what about the context that is we need to bring out the importance of context so now we can take the importance of all right we can take the help of fiedler's contingency theory fiedler's contingency model where he has given the impact of situation the context in which the leader works all right so how a leader uh, when a uh, when an individual becomes a leader and what kind of functions are performed by a leader in what kind of context right so favorable conditions highly unfavorable conditions so use this uh, fe fiedler's a uh, contingency model and distinguish favorable conditions and unfavorable conditions all right then moderate conditions all right so these are three different context of these are three different uh, in the uh, situations in which the leaders and administration works in highly favorable condition in highly unfavorable condition and moderate conditions all right so if you take this favorable condition it is in these conditions all right leaders are mostly involved in bringing change change can be brought change can be brought in highly favorable conditions all right unfavorable conditions right that is the complex conditions where it is not possible to bring any kind of change where all right where it is important to maintain status quo where it is important to maintain status quo so in highly unfavorable conditions status quo is maintained or required so we this is what the complex conditions moderate conditions right that is which are not too uh, favorable or not too unfavorable right that means here in this right leader can provide adequate or sufficient space or adequate uh, space for the followers to bring their change right so here change is possible and allowed all right so when a person placed under favorable condition or moderate conditions right they can show their leadership qualities and those placed under unfavorable conditions all right here they need to act like an what you call uh, they, they need to maintain status quo but the question is can we st uh, strictly separate leadership role and administrative role all right so leadership role and administrative role cannot be strictly 
separated because it depends upon the context in which the individual is functioning all right so the individual in favorable and moderate conditions they can show their leadership qualities right in complex condition they will show the the, the individual shows the administrator uh, quality that is the qualities of an administrator a person as an administrator and a person as a leader depends upon the contextuality or depends upon the situations in which the uh, individual and the organization is placed so it is the context of the organization that will de uh, that will determine leadership role and administrative role so we can support our conclusion to this question should be in support of this last line so contextuality of the organization the contextuality of organization will determine the leadership role and administrator role and it is this uh, uh, contextuality which is important for ensuring the success of organization so understanding situation understanding the uh, environment in which organization is placed is an important role of a leader or an administrator so here we are not making any difference between leader and administrator every administrator is a leader and every leader is an administrator based upon the conditions in which they are functioning all right so let me precise on this point so first of all try to define what is leadership role so define leadership so use the definitions given by uh, pre uh, preferably by ca bernard all right definitions given by uh, hicks and gallet all right so define leadership so use one or two statements then bring out essential functions bring out the functions of a leader all right with respect to change so here uh, as the question focus on change so leadership role with respect to change so leader as a change oriented function all right then try to bring out what is the difference between leader and a what you call a administrator then bring out the importance of context right and make sure how this context defines how this context differentiate leaders and administrator and how this context makes leader as an administrator or administrator as a leader right then no to uh, to answer this point take the help of fe fiedler's contingency model use three different contexts that is favorable unfavorable and moderate conditions then bring out the importance of context in making leader uh, leader as an administrator and administrator as a leader right and conclude the answer that all right the success of an organization always depends upon understanding the situation or a context in which the organization is placed so use some of the uh, important quotes say for example take the help of mary parker follett here and uh, conclude the answer so this is about the fourth question questions though it seems to be uh, what you call uh, typical but it is very very easy to understand if you are good in understanding the similarities the relation between the functional similarity between leadership and administration so let us move to the next question next question is on regulatory uh, framework right so we have a topic of organizations organizations where in which we have this topic of independent regulatory bodies so this question is based upon the topic so regulatory governance framework has become essential building block for world society discuss their potential and impact in discuss their potential and impact in fulfilling the hopes and demands all right so it is for 15 marks so regulatory governance has become a building block for world society 
राइट सो डिस्कस देयर पोटेंशियल सो पोटेंशियल इन बिकमिंग द बिल्डिंग ब्लॉक एंड व्हाट इज द इंपैक्ट इन फुलफिलिंग द होप्स एंड डिमांड्स ऑफ द सोसाइटी सो राइट सो रेगुलेटरी गवर्नेंस रेगुलेटरी गवर्नेंस इज द बेसिस फॉर इट इज द बेसिस फॉर वर्ल्ड सोसाइटी राइट सो नाउ we can start our answer right from the point of why we need this regulatory governance the need for regulate so what is what is regulatory governance all right the need for regulatory governance so here you can use uh, what you call all right the impact of lpg the impact of what you call entrepreneurial governance all right the impact of roll back of state all right and the need to protect the interest of people rights of people need to protect protection of uh, interest uh, rights of people all right so that is the that is we need to bring out the need for regulatory governance all right so now by highlighting this need for regulatory governance we will address this part of the question that is so why regulatory governance has become an essential block of world societies all right so now say we can use we can use what you call a uh, different examples here you can use all right unhcr the best example you can use un as a role all right wto it is up to us we can use one or two examples and then give the answer so why it be required wto at least for the sake of protecting the interest of the society protect the interest of the nation all right so what is the role of uh, wto or wto as a regulatory organization regulatory organization in protecting the interests and rights of the society the nation unhcr again the importance of unhcr how it protects the interests how it regulates the state right so you can use one or two examples right and uh, discuss and show that uh, show that uh, we can use this one or two examples and show that how they are building blocks of world society the same time what is their potential so what is their future role so in the coming days what kind of role they can have in the governance system so that is what we need to highlight all right and impact so how they are success to what extent how far they are successful in meeting the aspirations needs of the society and people so take the same example of unhcr and wto or about you call you take iiek it can be any kind of example just highlight how they are successful in meeting the hopes and demands of the society right so this should be the answer so coming to the next question the next question is on again the topic of accountability and control the topic of accountability and control the question is on social audit all right so social audit is not just saving the money it creates positive impact on governance so it is not just saving money but it has a positive impact on governance so first of all define social audit basic features of social audit all right then advantages of social audit in governance say simply rta responsiveness transparency accountability people participation so these are the basic advantages of what you call uh, uh this social audit so and here one more point how social audit is different from financial audit right so what is social audit and what is the difference between social audit and 
financial audit so this itself shows this itself answers the first part of the question that is social audit is not just saving money so financial audit is about saving money but social audit is beyond financial audit that is uh, that is it is not just about saving money but at the same time it has a positive impact on governance so this is the positive impact of governance all right so then conclude the answer so if possible as it is for 15 marks do take the case of nrga and write the answer that is use the example of nrga and try to complete the answer so this will be the a good answer the question is on development administration right so let me read the question once development administration embraces the array of new functions assumed by developing countries explain right so question revolves around question revolves around development administration embracing array of new functions right so here what are the new functions that are assumed by development administration right so development uh, administration particularly in developing countries there are three elements in this question right one is so there are three elements one is question is on development administration second element is new functions third element is by developing countries so that means our question our question revolves around all right mainly on this element what are the new functions what are the new functions that are assumed by development administration in developing countries all right so whatever we write our answer should revolve around this new kind of functions all right so the traditional functions and the uh, contemporary functions of development administration all right so let us the first point of the answer it should be from all right the first element of the answer first we need to define what is development administration so use one or two thinkers and define the word of development administration all right the first part so in first 25 words we need to define this development administration by using any thinker you can use george gant or you can use uh, riggs right so you can use uh, the uh, definitions given by edward Wiedner. so it uh, it is up to us so define this word development administration second paragraph of the answer should be around about traditional functions traditional functions of development administration that is normally now the doubt comes what to be uh, what to be written about this traditional function that is traditional functions means the functions assumed by the state the functions performed by the government particularly with respect to development in between 1952 we can take it as 1991 that is we are using npm or lpg as a timeline the function the the concept of development before lpg the concept of development after lpg so we see a change in the uh, definition of uh, development we change in the nature of functions of the government with respect to development after 1991 so we are using this 91 and uh, 1991 as a timeline so we need to define the functions before 1991 and after 1991 simply the capacity building nation building process socio economic change so these are the traditional developmental functions performed by the what you call our governments but after 1991 along with this along with uh, what you call a socio economic change along with capacity building so we see a new kind of functions all right a new kind of challenges posed by lpg on development particularly with the withdrawal of state with the what you call rollback of state right with the adoption of minimalistic approach right so we know uh, what npm has favored so what is a uh, cg catalytic government entera entrepreneurial uh, government so how this uh, this uh, new uh, philosophy has brought a change in the work of the state so we need to bring out the impact of this then we should talk about the new kind of developmental functions 
so now that is balancing both the welfare as well as regulatory activities right balancing both the rights of the poor underprivileged along with the market reforms so that is uh, the new challenges or the new developmental functions of the government lies in balancing both the market philosophy as well as welfare philosophy right so that should be the answer of the question right and third point so coming to the flow of answer so right traditional functions in uh, in almost all 30 to 40 words right and contemporary functions contemporary functions right in almost all 60 to 80 words right so uh, contemporary functions then what do you call bringing the conclusion all right so conclusion should be in 20 words all right so here the important part of the answer that is this part should dominate the answer that is contemporary functions performed by the development administration all right so take the uh, help of lpg take the help of npa and what you call uh, write the answer and you can also use you can also use the concepts of NP, uh, nps new public service you can use a critical approach you can use new public administration to write a beautiful answer so what are the uh, contemporary functions of the state what are the contemporary functions of development administration all right so simply take the help of what you call npa the five goals as given by uh, frank marini in npa or the uh, three goals as given by dwight waldo or felix in negro use of the uh, use them and write the answer instead of writing a journalistic answer you can use the help of new public administration nps to write a beautiful answer so they are they can be applied they are readily applicable in development administration so there lies our uh, difference right so when compared to other answers our answer should be on uh, these points that is we can use this uh, what you call npa or uh, new public service approach in uh, writing this answer right so these are about the question coming to the next question So next question is on public policy so you know this time i have seen more number of questions being asked on public policy question came on policy implementation question came on policy evaluation all right so two questions have come two questions have come only on public policy all right so rarely we see all right uh, 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 two questions being lifted from uh, from one single chapter but this time this has happened all right so policy evaluation contributes fundamental to the sound public governance right so first of all what is policy evaluation so what is policy evaluation what are different eva different elements of policy evaluation so talk about different elements of policy evaluation remember the question revolves around significance of policy evaluation right so we need not bring about the loopholes or drawbacks or the challenges so we need to highlight the importance of policy evaluation the crux of the answer is about what you call importance of policy policy evaluation in improving the public governance so how policy evaluation improves public governance so where the policy evaluation can really contribute all right so bring out the uh, what you call elements of policy evaluation so we have simply you can use uh, the impact evaluation as well as process evaluation right talk about these two things impact evaluation and process evaluation bring out the importance of impact evaluation then talk about the importance of process evaluation so importance of impact evaluation and importance of process evaluation so this impact evaluation will help you uh, will help to improve implementation process whereas process evaluation will help in policy design in designing the uh, 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 rational pu public policies 
in formulating the uh, best policies right in improving the policy education so policy formulation policy education as well as policy implementation right so talk about the importance of so this should be the crux of the answer that means right if you can write what is 20 25 words on what is policy evaluation right defining this impact evaluation process evaluation right in around 30 to 40 words right then this should be around 60 to 80 words this should be around 60 to 80 words right so if you can uh, divide this answer if you can divide this word limit it will be very easy then conclude the answer conclude the answer by saying that policy evaluation is an important element in the policy cycle there cannot be a right feedback right the entire feedback of public policy depends upon the way it is evaluated right so evaluation brings out a rational it brings out right a rational uh, uh, feedback to the public policy making right so conclude the answer by highlighting the importance of uh, what you call policy evaluation but the importance with respect to policy feedback right so this should be the answer about this question all right so moving to the next question so next question is on weber's bureaucratic construct all right so we can definitely say that without webarian bureaucracy there is no public administration the entire public administration revolves around webarian bureaucracy in each and every chapter when we see the syllabus of uh, public administration in each and every chapter of public administration you see the uh, element of webarian bureaucracy so so any chapter or entire public administration all right it revolves around this bureaucracy so bureaucracy always acts as a heuristic so let us see the question based upon this weber's construct of bureaucracy has served a great heuristic purpose in furthering research in the field of comparative public administration do you agree with this statement give reasons all right all right so do you agree with the statement give reasons that is here in what way Weber's bureaucracy provides acts as a heuristic. All right. So how it guides, how it guides research in what you call field of comparative public administration. That means, so we are using Weberian bureaucracy, all right, as a heuristic to compare public administration system in different countries. So we have different kinds of approaches, right? We have different approaches uh, given by uh, uh, Ferrell Hedy Henderson, all right? So four approaches given by uh, Ferrell Hedy, right? Three approaches given by what you call uh, Henderson. Out of all these approaches, the most possible we have a traditional approach, bureaucratic approach, middle range approach, all right? Uh, so out of all these approaches, general systems approach, the most popular approaches used in compared to public administration are one is general systems approach and the other one is bureaucratic approach, all right? So general system approach that was used by uh, Riggs in his comparative analysis and the other one is Weberian bureaucracy but again when you see the general systems approach right even in systems approach we tend to compare all right bureaucratic subsystem all right so along with other subsystems even bureaucratic subsystem is also being used even the functioning of bureaucratic subsystem is what you call are taken into consideration right so more focus is given more focus uh, is given uh, on the working of bureaucratic subsystem so if you take uh, the web uh, if you take rigs model rigs has used right sala the word of sala right now what is sala sala is nothing but a bureaucratic subsystem of a nation so his focus was on the working of bureaucratic subsystem that means even general uh, even general systems approach or simply systems approach that was used in compared public administration relayed on comparing bureaucracy so now we can orally say that all right a uh, weber's theory or weber's bureaucracy acted as a heuristic in 
right in comparing different administrative systems or it acted as a heuristic it acted as a basis for the research in cpa all right so let us talk about the uh, flow of the answer first of all what is cpa when this cpa has emerged all right the background of emergence of cpa that is formation of uh, computer administrative group the role of rigs the objectives of the computer public administration the open objectives the hidden agenda right the support given by the uh, american administration the ford foundation support right so talk about all the basics all background about uh, cpa in around 25 words right so this should be your first part right then talk about a uh, different approaches different approaches used in the research of what you call computer public administration simply use the approaches as given by federal hedi all right then go to our main part of the answer that is bureaucracy so the importance of bureaucracy in research on compared to public administration all right so how bureaucracy so i short leave the word bu how bureaucracy has been used by researchers for their analysis of different administrative systems or different what you call uh, administrative systems so simply use the systems approach rigs and how rigs has used this bureaucratic sala for its analysis right so simply by uh, what you call by using this uh, example of uh, rigs we can uh, uh, we can say that bureaucracy has acted as what you call uh, model even anthony downs even anthony downs approach the bureaucratic approach adopted by what you call uh, anthony downs all right so this is how we can say that bureaucracy is the basis for the research in compared to public administration then so uh, if you write this in 25 words different approaches not more than 25 to 30 words and this should be around 60 to 80 words then conclusion that means conclusion should be by highlighting the importance of bureaucratic approach in understanding different administrative systems all right so why we cannot avoid bureaucratic approach all right in the compared to public administration all right so with this note end the answer all right so this should be the answer for this question coming to uh, the next question that is 5d standards are the foundations which do not replace regulations but complement them all right so standards all right so the, those standards which are been brought out after having the experimental research that is those what we call standards which are being designed brought tested after having an empirical research now first of all define what is standards right so what do you mean by standards when they are regarded as standards why they are regarded as standards so here bring out the importance of empirical research empirical research right logical reasoning right in uh, designing these standards right and verification of results as well as replication of results when the same result is replicated several times right over different periods of time then we can call them as standards so standards are those which are always verifiable which are always replicated right over a period of time across the cultures right across the settings right so which have a cross cultural applicability so it can be any principles or rules or anything all right we call them as standards all right so standards are the one which act as a benchmark scales
they are benchmark scales so this cannot be replaced absolutely these are the foundations which cannot be replaced all right so they are the scale which is used to measure any kind of activity measurement of anything it can be the work it can be the behavior of individual it can be behavior of bureaucracy it can be the working of the state it can be any kind of what you call activity so a scale that is used to measure a universal scale that is used to measure we call them as standards so standards only help regulate or uh, help in complementing the regulation so what kind of regulations are uh, are to be made so regulation means what the kind of improvements right so understanding the deviation measuring the deviations as well as improving the deviations or overcoming the deviations right so standards are used standards are used for designing the regulations that is the reason why right we we say that standards complement the regulations but not replacing them right so standards are the one which are used to design regulations all right so these regulations are designed by measuring deviation so understanding deviation measuring deviation all right then using these measures to design the regulations that means overall we are proving that standards standards they strengthen they complement the regulations all right so this is what been done to take any kind of reform process any kind of reform process standards are been prepared we call in terms of different types of uh, things we call them as standards are called as manuals standards are called as code of conduct all right standards are in the form of rules all right so these are the standards all right a code of conduct how uh, what kind of behavior is expected how a public servant should be how a civil servant should be how a structure of organization should be what kind of functions are to be done by manager a civil servant or an organization so all these are standards which are in the form of manuals the expected behavior the expected outcomes so these are clearly specified so it is these manuals it is these clearly specified code of conduct which is used to measure the individuals the organization and their what you call deviation and based upon this measurement corrections are made that means standard standards are used in improving standards are used in strengthening that is the reason why they are called as complementary in nature all right so this should be the answer for this question all right coming to next question the question is on budgeting the question is on what called outcome budgeting outcome budgeting addresses the weakness uh, weaknesses of performance budgeting elaborate all right so uh, now the one who has read the the topic of budget in nicolas henry then they can i think they can uh, answer this question very uh, very really difficulty all right so first of all the question is about two things all right comparing outcome budgeting with the performance budgeting all right so how outcome budgeting addresses the weaknesses of performance budgeting all right so first of all our answer should start from the importance of defining budgeting and bring out the importance of budgeting so there should be two types of uh, two things one is definition so you the definition of kautilya wildavsky red hoover commission how they have defined what you call uh, this what you call uh, budget right so when you go through lakshmikant right you can easily uh, what you call answer these uh, questions and i'm uh, to be frank to say to be frank to say uh, anyone who is good in uh, lakshmikant public administration right they can complete they can uh, what do you call 
with an ease they can answer 50 percent of the questions without uh, any difficult right so just use the definitions one or two definitions take it from Lakshmi Kant if you are, if you can remember but if you write these definitions definitely it will bring the edge remember I got 372 the reason is this is the only approach right so so first define this what is budget so along with definition so do use one or two things and normal and not more than that because it is only for 10 marks right then talk about the importance of budgeting right then what is performance budgeting just uh, what do you call what is performance budget uh, how it got emerged right the role of over commission in india the role of first arc so it was first uh, introduced on the recommendations of over commissions in america then in india it was recommended by first arc right so and what is outcome budget so outcome budget is uh, what do you call a new form of budgeting that got emerged again in America after 1991. Outcome budget, target oriented budget, result oriented budget. So when we see these words, right, simply we can remember the uh, new public management which gave more importance to outcomes, results, right. So now define this what is performance budgeting, what is outcome budgeting and in what way outcome budgeting is improvement over what you call uh, performance budgeting so in performance budgeting right importance is given importance is given right to both importance is given to both inputs as well as outputs right so here when we talk about uh, what you call uh, outcome budget it is more than inputs and outputs right so with respect to accounting right with respect to managerial decision making so how outcome budgeting how outcome budgeting is superior or it is better than performance budgeting based in, in terms of managerial decision making in terms of accounting in terms of accountability right so apart from inputs and outputs so measure this right so based upon these parameters right uh, compare outcome budget with the performance budget and say that outcome budget is far better than performance budget that is the reason why after 1991 after 1991 every country including india have shifted from performance based budgeting to the outcome budgeting okay so this should be the answer Coming to sixth question, the question is on Rickson concept of development, where he defined development in terms of change, right? And uh, Rick's talked about different forces, particularly he talked about exogenetic change as well as endogenetic change, right? So if you are good in uh, Prasad and Prasad, we can easily answer this question. So it is not difficult to answer this question. All right so first of all we will try to understand different elements of the question all right the question states that more exogenetic so if there is more exogenetic uh, if the more exogenetic the process of diffraction so exogenetic in the process of diffraction right so first there is an element of process of diffraction right so the more exogenetic leads to more formalism and more what you call heterogeneous heterogeneous in its prismatic phase right the more endogenetic less is formalism and less is heterogenetic character all right so examine the hypothesis of Riggs all right so we need to explain Rickson concept of exogenetic change exogenetic process of diffraction 
endogenetic process of diffraction and the impact of exogenetic process of diffraction on formalism heterogeneous. Similarly, the impact of endogenetic process of diffraction on what do you call uh, formalism as well as heterogeneity. All right. So this is if we can divide these elements, then it is very uh, easy to answer the uh, elements of rigs. All right. So first of all, what is diffraction? How uh, how this diffraction is defined by rigs? So first of all, start our answer with the uh, with the definition on diffraction, the process of diffraction. Right. So diffraction as well as integration. So how rigs has what do you call uh, defined development right so de development is always defined as both the process of diffraction and integration of structures as well as functions right so it is development is regarded as the process of increasing autonomy of structures so there is a structural differentiation functional differentiation as well as structural integration as well as functional integration and in this process the autonomy of different structures is increased so Rixian concept of development Rixian concept of diffraction right and what is diffraction and how this diffraction how this change is seen in heterogeneous societies or how this change is seen in prismatic societies right so what is a prismatic phase so what is the prismatic phase define this prismatic phase along with the process of diffraction right so how this diffraction in a prismatic phase or in prismatic societies how this diffraction is brought out the next paragraph right so in first paragraph para one try to define what is prismatic society or prismatic phase what is the level of diffraction and integration diffraction and integration in what you call prismatic societies All right now the factors the, the factors that bring diffraction the factors behind diffraction that is both the exogenetic factors as well as endogenetic factors first to then first talk about exogenetic factors all right so what is exogenetic factors how these exogenetic factors bring a kind of change and what is the impact of change all right so what is the impact of change on formalism as well as heterogeneity the question itself gives the answer the question says that there is more formalism as well as more heterogeneous whether Rix is right or wrong whether Rix is right in uh, saying that the exogenetic process will really increase formalism and heterogeneous. Right? So we need to uh, what do you call, uh, uh, answer this point. So first in the in the in the first paragraph, say that right, according to Rix, right, exogenetic change that is a change that is brought by external factors will definitely increase formalism. Right? So what is formalism? define formalism all right define formalism according to Riggs all right and what is heterogeneous character all right so that is what you uh, we need to do all right now in a uh, in the uh, first paragraph that is a we should we should support Riggs that is we should say that right exogenetic character uh, exogenetic change will definitely increase formalism as well as heterogeneous At the same time you should also bring out the other side of the coin that is we should also bring out the uh, criticism of rigs you can use gh walson you can use michael crozier right so uh, what do you call it is up to us so support rigs as well as criticize rigs that means it need not necessarily exogenetic change need not necessarily bring more amount of formalism as well as more amount of heterogeneous so remember Riggs has used only one side of this Riggs has seen only one side of the coin he has not focused on the other side of the coin but in our answer we should right, uh, provide both these pictures we should provide both what you call uh, what Riggs said 
that is in support of rigs as well as in criticism of the rigs similarly then talk about then talk about the uh, endogenetic factors the endogenetic change what is a uh, endogenetic change right the factors behind this endogenetic change the process of bringing endogenetic change the impact of endogenetic change on formalism as well as heterogeneity same pros as well as cons support in, uh, 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 in favor of rigs and oppose uh, that is criticize uh, against the rigsian concept so as we are writing an answer as we are writing an answer we need to bring complete picture of this issue so we need to examine this hypothesis so what is the truth in this our uh, what you call rickson concept our answer should focus on this truth of rickson concept so there is both a uh, truth as well as there are certain what you call neglected aspects of rigs so we need to highlight both these things right that should be the our answer right so if you can divide uh, the easiness of the answer lies when you can divide this question into different parameters then we can write the answers very easily so defining prismatic society defining uh, uh, what do you call diffraction the process of diffraction in prismatic societies then uh, we, talk, we, we, uh, we talk about the concept of exogenetic change the impact of exogenetic change what rigs has said what rigs has failed right then what is endogenetic change what rigs has said and what rigs has failed then right coming to our universal conclusion right so universal conclusion is that right exogenetic change or endogenetic change right may not be the same as given by rigs it can be two ways right so that should be our conclusion right so coming to the next question the next question is on the environment and situational conditions in which the government operates have an important bearing on its human resource development practice so it is a topic of personal administration the environmental factors the situation in which the government is placed right so now uh, though it is a question on uh, personal administration all right then as the question revolves around the environment and situational conditions all right the environment and situational conditions that is ecological approach ecological approach on public administration ecological approach on personal administration so the environment and the ecology in which the government is placed always impacts the government not only the government but even the what you call the human resource practice of the government so if right what do you call if we can highlight this point this would be the much better point that is if you can start your answer by highlighting the ecological uh, approach to public administration ecological approach or systems approach to public administration so we can use this we can use robert dal we can use john gas we can use uh, what you call rigs right so rigs is the one who has used this right approach it is a rigs who has uh, what you call popularized this ecological approach in public administration so there is nothing wrong in using rigs here right so even he wrote a book on this ecology of public administration all right so the ecology the environment within which the government is placed has an important role in placing in placing what do you call uh, 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 this human resources that is human resource development human resource practices it depends upon in which the uh, government is placed right so now again the kind of situations present before 1991 and after 1991 again we can also bring out this is one phase so before 1991 and after 1991 the human resource practices human resource development all right before 1991 
and after 1991. Apart from this, apart from 1991, that is after the emergence of LPG, this is one thing. Now, along with LPG, if you can note the importance of new public governance. So, after 2008, so, after 2008, we see emergence of a new thing called as new public governance. So, we had new public service approach. Along with new public service, we also have another thing, another uh, sub paradigm, uh, another paradigm that got emerged in public administration is new public governance. Right? So, NPG. Right? So, NPS, NP, uh, NPG. So, after 1991 and after 2008, particularly after subprime crisis, right? So, how this environment, how this environment has affected human resource development practices of a nation, right? So, though it is what you call a question on personal administration, we can also bring in the impact of developing countries perspective like India, right? So, if you can, uh, if you can, uh, what do you call, uh, highlight this. points the answer is total different it will be the perfect answer right so we need to highlight the situations the environment and situational conditions so here environment and situational conditions means the governments the conditions in which the governments are placed the governments placed under socialist conditions the governments placed under what you call uh, uh, economic uh, or capitalistic conditions governments placed after this subprime crisis so these are different types of conditions situational conditions are environmental conditions in which the governments are placed and how these conditions have what you call uh, uh, affected human resource development that is not only the recruitment the kind of training that should be given to the public servants or civil servants all right so let us go to the answer now so first of all all right let us start our answer from this point of what is the environment and the situation so for this use ecological approach write this write the uh, meaning of ecological approach and systems approach second one all right the governments placed under the governments placed under socialistic conditions that is before 1991 before 1991 so what is the kind of recruitment practices all right and what is the focus of training so human resource development development always depends upon the kind of training that is given to the human resources the kind of training that is imparted to the human resources the focal elements of training before 1991 after 1991 right we see a role change right we see a change in the nature of state impact of neoliberal society on bureaucracy impact of neoliberal society impact of neoliberalism on public administration if anyone has read igno then you can write a very good answer on this point right the impact of what you call 1991 reforms or neoliberalism or capitalism on bureaucracy or public administration so after 1991 so what is the kind of recruitment and what is the kind of training right and after 2008 same recruitment training so if we can uh, highlight these three phases definitely our answer will be unique and good all right so this should be the part of the answer all right so i always uh, request the students who are going for ups exam to read igno books thoroughly all right they are the one which will help you a lot
right so this should be the answer all right so that means our conclusion human resource development should always be in tune with the changing conditions right the entire human resource practices should be it should be what you call uh, what you call uh, it should uh, it should go along with the changing times so use the statement of glenn stall right he is the one uh, who has given the importance of public services herbert feener right so you can find these definitions again in lakshmikant or you can find them in what you call any uh, any of the public administration books but right uh, in igno books as well as in lakshmikant right so reading textbooks is very important so this should be the answer for this question coming to the next question so question is on what do you call lindblom's policy making see sorry lindblom's decision making model right so charles lindblom who is known for incremental decision making right an incremental decision making that is popularly used in governmental decision making so governmental decision making right it is more similar or it goes along with the lines of what do you call uh, lindblom's model right so the question is about charles lindblom right lindblom and his incremental model incremental model of decision making all right so let me read the question once lindblom regarded decision making as an unattainable goal in the light of the statement suggests me to avoid policy failures right so decision making is an unattainable goal suggest measures to avoid policy failures right so they, there are two things which are attached so decision making and policies in what way policies and decisions are interrelated so if we can bring out this link half of the answer is over then what kind of theory was given by lindblom and how it is different from or how it is what do you call a uh, uh different from other popular decision making theories like uh, herbert simons all right so if you can uh, analyze this then the second part of the answer is over all right so first of all so I'll, I'll 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 try to give a brief description of charles lindblom theory all right so incremental model of decision making also called as partisan model also called as step by step model of decision making all right so that means a new decisions are made a new decisions are made right based upon the existing decisions right so based upon the existing decisions new decisions are been taken or new decisions are attached to the existing decisions right so right so the base, there will be a basis for a decision and based upon this basic decisions all other decisions are been made so an e decision is attached to the other decisions that is what incrementalism in decision making we take one decision based upon the decision based upon the working of the decision we will take another decision again and so on so on so it goes on so that is what charles lindblom's incremental model of decision making is all right so which is mostly seen in government it is mostly seen in governmental decision making right so lindblom regarded decision making as an unattainable goal now what do you mean by unattainable goal what is this unattainableness uh, means it is simply rationality rationality in decision making as simon pointed out rationality in decision making is always a difficult or it is unattainable all right so now as it is unattainable 
what kind of decisions should be made and how decisions should be made right so here we can use the help of simon simon and his reasons for not achieving rationality are simply hurdles hurdles faced in achieving the rationality so organizational uh, factors situational factors informational factors individual factors administrative factors right the structural factors so there can be different types of factors that will limit the rationality that is the reason why decision making is an unattainable right so we always keep uh, that is the administrative man right the administrative man always make a series of decisions which is nothing but a policy so policy is always defined as a series of decisions made right a decisions way uh, policy is nothing but uh, policy is nothing but a decision made which is uh, which is changed continuously that is there is a change in the decisions already made and new decisions are added to the existing decisions and this series of decisions we call it as policy according to charles lindblom all right so highlight the different challenges or hurdles faced in achieving the rationality and it is because of these hurdles it is because of these hurdles right decision making is an unattainable all right so to overcome this he has charles lindblom has uh, what we call provided an incremental model of decision making where one decision is added to the other decision and this uh, and this is this simply goes on right now how to avoid these what you call uh, hurdles the kind of hurdles so when you can uh, when you can identify the hurdles then facing these challenges removing these hurdles is not a difficult task right so removal of hurdles so when you know organizational factors personal factors or the situational factors the structural factors then we can simply avoid these failures and improve the policy making right the best example of this charles lindblom's theory is the uh, policy on poverty elevation right so how this poverty uh, the public policy on poverty elevation has been designed from 1970s till till date right so what kind of decisions were taken so initially poverty elevation was uh, what you call uh, targeted by using food distribution then we talked about providing of employment then we talked about distribution of income then we talked about providing of what you call housing facilities so if you take this series of decisions first it was food then employment then infrastructure that is basic amenities then what you call income distribution that means one decision is add to the other decision right that means a typical government decision making or a typical policy making in the government a new decisions or new policies are added to the existing decision so this is the best example of incremental model so rationality in this kind of policy making can be done only when the uh, hurdles are identified and they are removed right so the crux of the answer revolves around this element of identifying hurdles and removing the hurdles right so even in prasadam prasad you can find these hurdles we have a chart we have chart in what you call the topic of uh, say uh, prasadam prasad in, uh, in, the, in the in the in the topic of herbert simon in prasadam prasad as well as in lakshmi kant public administration book right so when you go to the chart you can find different types of hurdles right so our answer revolves around this element coming to this question that is question number 7 so let me uh, let me read the question once question is on washington consensus the washington consensus were far from optimal for transitional economies in backdrop of in this backdrop discuss the change of direction towards post washington consensus all right so the washington consensus were far from optimal for transitional economies 
in backdrop of this discuss the change of direction towards post washington consensus we need to discuss the change of direction towards post washington consensus so question is on what was expected in washington consensus so what is what is what is washington consensus what what are the principle or what are the outcomes after this particular 1991 next point is how this principles are the advocates of the principles are far from transitional economy the realities of transitional economies right and what is the change in direction towards post washington consensus within the transitional economy so what kind of change what kind of change or what kind of direction of change is seen in transitional economies after washington consensus now very first thing we should understand we will explain what is washington consensus is all right so that is what the most important element is all right so so first of all we need to understand what is this washington consensus all right all right so what is this washington consensus so this was the term was used in 1989 all right simply this washington consensus propagates the idea of free market economies free market economy simply that right, even if you don't have any idea about what is washington consensus then as by the name of washington you can simply imagine that it is something about lpg it is something about free market economies there is nothing wrong right so if you have a uh, if you can uh, think common sensely you, uh, you will get the answer even without any specific preparation right uh, you can uh, identify this so washington consensus is all about all right uh, propagating the idea of free market economies all right then when we talk about free market economies immediately the 10 commandments of npm all right so then think about npm what npm uh, propagates all right what are the futures of npm what are the goals of npm what is the role of state according to npm according to the advocates of npm all right so it was in 1988 it was in 1988 that is after second minobrook conference right as well as after the book of ted gardner and david ospan right this word of uh, npm got popularized by christopher hood right so what was the role of state according to npm right and what are the principles of npm we have 10 principles so uh, you can uh, use this 10 principles simply the lpg right liberalization privatization globalization uh, trade production market production uh, uh, coming with an what you call uh, uh, legal mechanism to protect the uh, what you call uh, copyrights or patent rights right it is about uh, protecting the patents right so all these are a part of washington consensus right so now this washington consensus was supported by the international financial institutions like imf world bank and they are been ad actively advocated and implemented by developed countries like us the european countries so for them it is more beneficial these principles are more workable and more beneficial for developed countries but coming to developing countries that is transitional economies so question revolves around this element of transitional economies so to what extent the transitional economies can uh, follow these uh, principles of washington consensus right and if these principles are followed what is the direction of the change right 
what can what kind of change that can be expected in this transitional economies right so change of direction towards post washington consensus right so there are two things there are two things interlinked here the direction of change and change of direction so how states got changed right in direction of washington consensus how states have modified themselves how how states got changed themselves to accept this washington consensus there are two things so we'll try to uh, touch both these elements so when we write the answer we right we should give both the elements of change change of direction and direction of change right change in the nature of state nature of state as well as change brought by this what you call lpg simply changes brought by lpg right changes in the nature of state right so what kind of change that we see in the state in its functioning as well as in its policy making so we need to highlight these points right so this is one of the tricky question that is asked right so we need to balance all these elements right so if we miss this definitely our answer will get washed away so how change how states how the nations have implemented what kind of measures are taken by the governments to implement this washington consensus or simply what kind of measures that are taken by the government right to implement lpg the change of direction towards what you call post washington consensus right so to achieve to implement washington consensus what are the things done by the states right simply if you take india the 1991 reforms 1991 reforms itself is a direction change in the direction right disinvestment policies right privatization right then what you call uh, uh, liberalizing delicensing deregulation right so decontrolling right memorandum of understanding right so all these are different types of golden handshake policy right uh, all these are the changes that we can see right in the direction towards post washington consensus so we need to highlight this change we need to highlight this so we have a topic called as state versus market debate in development administration so this question belongs to that ch chapter so this state versus markets right so what has been done what has been done after this uh, this what you call washington consensus what kind of measures are taken by the state so we need to highlight all these uh, measures towards lpg simply right so right from 1991 reforms to what you call the present day disinvestment policy of the government right so this should be the crux of the answer so let me discuss the entire flow of the answer once so first of all discuss what is washington consensus then if it is possible talk about the principles of washington consensus right then measures taken measures taken by transitional economies transitional economies towards washington consensus what is the impact of the change impact of change after washington consensus that is both on the economic fronts as well as from the social welfare fronts from the economic side as well as social welfare side so simply we can also bring out the element of what you call uh, exclusive growth 
not inclusive this exclusive so one of the negative outcome of this what you call uh, lpg is all right uh, growth being driven by some sections or some sectors but not by all so most of the sections of society are being excluded from the growth process so it is one of the outcome of this what you call uh, post washington consensus the impact of change so and balance both state and in conclusion balance both state as well as markets so this should be the crux of the answer all right so first two three points majority of the answer should revolve around the first three points 80 percent of the answer should be around these points all right and even bring out this impact of change all right so if we if it is done then you can uh, our answer is completed right so these are about the question moving to the next question second again a question on budgeting all right so previously we have seen a question uh, what you call even in for uh, 10 markers there was a question on uh, outcome budget now again for 15 marks there was a question on budgeting so let me read the question once a sound budgeting system is a one which engenders trust among the citizens that the government is listening to their concerns elaborate this with the uh, elaborate this in the context of budgetary governance all right so now there is one hint to start our answer all right a sound budgeting system is one which engenders trust among the citizens a budget that brings a trust within the citizens a citizens trusting the government a, a citizens feeling that right the government is working for them a citizens feel of right a government of their own right so citizens that the government is listening to their concerns now this is the word i am talking about right the word of listening right listening rather than telling <clears throat> then serving rather than steering so if we to uh, if we take these two words these are the words which belongs to new public service nps right so it is this nps which has talked about the, what you call listening rather than telling all right serving rather than steering so npm talked about steering npm talked about telling nps talked about listening and serving right so now so if you can uh, uh, identify these then our answer is over right a sound budgeting system is a one which creates an impact which creates a trust among the people right trust among the people about the government that the government is working for them so how people will come to know that the government is working from uh, for them both by its fiscal policy right the fiscal policy second one all right the allocations made by the government to the welfare programs the welfare uh, the welfare programs designed the welfare programs that are being budgeted by the government the amount of allocations to the welfare programs it is from this right the people will come to know about the working of government right so first of all define what is budget right importance of budget right so why it should be called as budgetary governance so this need to be highlighted why should, why should be called as budgetary governance right so then how government uh, how budget creates trust so talk about the role of fiscal policy right the role of what do you call allocations made the preference is shown in budget you see if you remember previously upsc in upsc there were two, two times questions were asked about the role of budget as a socio economic development so budget as a tool for bringing socio economic development so this was the question asked previously in upsc mains 
right so right our answer the, there is no difference between the previous question asked and the present question it is almost all same all right so preferences given in budget so budget as a tool of bringing socio economic change that is how this budget promotes equality how this budget removes the gaps the income gaps all right between the society so it is by it is by highlighting these points we can say that budget is a one which what do you call uh, creates trust among the people so it is by this we can say the importance of budget and budgetary governance all right so this is about the question moving to the next question so next question is again on personal administration so earlier question was asked on human resource development now the question directly is on training right so performance problems are rarely caused simply by lack of training and rarely can be and rarely can performance be improved by training alone that means question simply states that training alone is not a causing factor and training alone is not a remedy that is what the question is all right so there are two things here performance problems role of training performance problems and role of training so if we, if we, if if we, uh, if we want to answer this question beautifully we can use taylor and we can also use bernard so taylor has talked about what do you call scientific recruitment scientific training right so taylor also talked about the what do you call soldering effect the kind of soldering effect that we can see in the organizations all right so the role of incentives the kind of incentive mechanism that is a uh, piece set system that was uh, uh, designed by taylor so we can use this what do you call taylor's uh, what do you call uh, principles of scientific management theory similarly bernard talked about the importance of incentives contribution satisfaction equilibrium so how this contribution depends upon from the side of what you call employees right the the, uh, the the nature of moral types of morals how an organization will contribute to increased moral among the public uh, among the employees right so if all right if you are smart enough we can use both bernard and taylor to answer this question right so performance problems can uh, performance problems are rarely caused simply by lack of training and rarely all right can be improved by training all right so training the question revolves around this training training is the main uh, focal point of the question all right so first of all what is training define training all right so define training according to ad gorwala define training according to ashton committee so we have both ashton committee then we have ad gorwala right who has defined this training so define training according to what you call uh, ashton Gor uh, gorwala so what kind of improvements can be made right S right this is the, uh, this should be the first part second part right improvements improvements that can be brought about by using this training so what kind of improvements can be brought but along with formal training along with formal training what are the other parameters that will determine that will shape right the performance so now bring the a uh, role of performance and training what are different factors apart from this uh, training that affects performance of the 
individuals the organizational structure structuring of organization the objectives of the organization say for example the bernard's concept of objectives right coordination cooperation right the kind of incentive mechanisms the, the uh, zone of indifference right the kind of recruitment practices that are used the kind of evaluation different types of evaluation practices right the what you call the superior subordinate relationships in terms of uh, uh, in uh, evaluation the code of conduct so all these are different factors that normally affect the performance of the individual right so training alone is not the factor that will uh, affect the performance so performance problems are not just because of training or training alone will not remedy the what you call performance so we need to focus even on other factors to improve the performance of the individuals right so our answer should focus on each and uh, uh, every element so on recruitment right on assessment that is on performance appraisal the practice uh, what you call uh, the uh, the kind of uh, mechanisms used in uh, in appraising the performance uh, in uh, in appraising the performances the structure of the organization the levels of hierarchy right so take three or four factors analyze them and say that right apart from training these are the factors that will affect the performance so when you write this answer do try to use the the thinker spot also right so marks depends upon how you are using your subject how you are using the thinkers so this is where you can make a difference gaining 300 plus marks you can score easily 330 marks i'm sure because right in my first three attempts i gave six mains in public administration i never got less than 302 in my first attempt i got 302 and my fourth attempt onwards i started scoring more than 340 every time the reason is how we what you call apply our theories how we apply what you call different uh, what you call uh, charters in the uh, questions asked so we should be very flexible in using our subject when you, when you do this definitely will get the good marks this is about the uh, question on 7 uh, 7c let us move to the next question the next question is on audit the audit functions has always been viewed as an integral part of government financial management discuss the significance of internal audit in improving the performance of the government sector right so the question is very specific the question is on two things one is importance of audit and the second one is importance of internal audit right so we have two types of audits one is external audit as well as internal audit all right so first define what is audit very simple question what is what is audit right so what is the significance of audit significance of audit uh, in terms of ensuring accountability answerability right uh, laying uh, what you call uh, 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 money uh, as in terms of the uh, parliament's mandate right so how that money is been used the kind of expenditure patterns of the uh, government right so how uh, this audit has improved the performance of the government so here audit as a tool of financial uh, financial management so we need to uh, highlight this uh, aspect we need to highlight the importance of audit right so bring out the significance of audit in around what you call uh, around 50 words not more than that all right see as it is for 20 marks so 50 to 60 words is enough about the significance of audit all right about what is audit all right now what is internal audit what are the agencies involved in internal audit normally internal audit is done within the agency normally it is done by the heads of the government right so it is the heads of the uh, agency so it can be the uh, hod of the department or a ministry or what you call of the wing or it can be anyone right so at their own level within their what you call own uh, division or circle or uh, 
within their own level there can be the internal audit right so internal audit is more important equally as external audit and the, uh, and the base difference is external uh, external audit it is seen all right once in three or four years that is there is a time gap in, in the external audit but coming to internal audit it is a, a regular and continuous aspect so when there is a regular and continuous audit the problems are frequently noticed they are frequently corrected right so what is internal audit who performs this internal audit so what kind of challenges or what kind of uh, things that are noted during this internal audit and how they can be improved right uh, at their own levels so even without waiting for the parliament's approval or from some uh, even without waiting for someone's uh, vertical approval some external approval the individuals within their own agencies they can make their own improvements right so laying of uh, what do you call a uh, proposing of budget right using of budgets maintaining their own account system based upon the uh, manuals given to them right so uh, simplifying their own account system right this is how the internal audit can improve the performance of the agencies right so what is internal audit the structure the importance so this should be within 100 to 120 words this is the main part of the answer all right and conclusion so audit should not be seen as an criticism it should be seen as an educative one simple right a very common criticism that we can use sorry the, the very common conclusion that we can use so audit can be used or audit can be seen as a way of educative criticism but not an what do you call a uh, a negative criticism all right so this should be the answer for this question coming to the next question all right so most civil services regime still equate public sector ethics with the anti corruption efforts discuss the insufficiency of ethics code in this background all right so in most of the countries in most of the countries or in within the public sector right or within the government system civil service civil service regimes so we are, there is a word used civil service regimes in most of the civil service regimes right still equate public sector ethics as anti corruption so there is a narrow meaning of ethics ethics is simply seen as anti corruption ethics is simply seen as anti, anti corruption so it is just a, a narrow vision of ethics so ethics is more beyond this vertical corruption so unless this is known unless this element is highlighted then there is no point in talking about ethical code of conduct or there is no point in talking about a code of conduct to promote ethics right so it is true that there is an insufficiency because as long as ethics is seen just as an anti corruption the uh, the ethics code will be insufficient right so it uh, uh, ethics code ethics code should include beyond this anti corruption say for example coming to the answer first of all all right we need to determine public sector ethics we need to determine public sector ethics so what is what do you mean by public sector ethics right and how coming to the question how this ethics is seen that is ethics is just seen as anti corruption which is only one facet of it is only one facet of corruption all right so a comprehensive ethical code comprehensive ethical code that sh should contain the following that is talk about this narrow definition talk, talk about this narrow element of ethics then talk about what should be included within the ethical code so here you can use what you call and uh, 
recommendations of nolan committee recommendations of ad gorwala committee you can use any of the committee on ethics in india all right santanam committee or you talk about uh, first arc second arc we have because this uh, arc is right so we have uh, simply we can use this code right selflessness honesty integrity objectivity loyalty so all this uh, as given by nolan committee all right so this should be a part of all right what do you call behavioral code of conduct right so what should be the comprehensive ethical code right so talk about this right and bring out the what do you call uh, uh, way of promoting ethics in public sector so our conclusion should start uh, complete our conclusion should be with this ways of promoting ethical ethics in public sector all right so with this complete our answer all right so if you can go with this approach i think you'll get a decent marks right in the uh, uh, exam right moving to the next question so failure of public policies has often been attributed to problems of implementation while implementers questions implementers question the policy design right discuss the contestation so somehow if you take you take anything you take anything all right there is a policy failure now if you take this question question revolves around failures of public policy failure of public policy right so failure of public policy has often been attributed to the problems of implementation right so there is one argument that these failures are because of problems of implementation while implementers question the policy design so what will be the reason may be but there is a policy failure which is because of both policy formulation as well as policy implementation that is what the question revolves around this so question is about right reasons of public policy failure so the one who has read this ignore public policy only one page in public policy formulation one page in policy implementation if you are thorough with that i think you can write a very good answer not more than igno right reasons of public policy uh, reasons of failure of failure of public policy right so one set of the reason is problems with the implementation problems of implementation second set of factors is problems with the policy design all right so identify different types of factors that affects policy implementation all right so factors are uh, related to the policy document factors to the uh, what you call support services like human resources financial resources right problems related to the uh, vested interest problems related to the the motivation and will factors of the implementers so we have four different types of factors all right one is policy document second one is what do you call uh, auxiliary services such as human resources financial resources right problems with the vested interests problems with the uh, 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 with respect to the psychological problems or psychological uh, factors of the implementers these are four different types of factors that affects policy implementation these are the problems of implementation policy design the structures involved the structures involved in policy designing the factors affecting policy designing the pressure groups the media right uh, the the uh, the party ideology the international pressures so all these are different factors that affect policy formulation so policy failures lies not in one single factor it lies both in what you call policy design as well as policy implementation all right so if we can highlight these problems then we can say that failure of public policy cannot be pinpointed or cannot be located into one single set of factor but it has 
right uh, what call uh, wider what it requires a wider analysis all right so our conclusion our conclusion should be that failure of public policy lies in both design as well as what you call implementation right and unless these are overcome we cannot have a rational public policy right so this is about the section b of paper 1